Anne and I are here to talk about the respiratory system. As you will have learned from bioscience, body cells need a continuous supply of oxygen and nutrients, and the nutrients is really in the form of glucose. When the cells have oxygen and glucose together, they produce energy, and this is in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. The function of the respiratory system, or the lungs, essentially, is to ensure that the body takes in enough oxygen for the cells and then gets rid of the waste products, carbon dioxide. If there's too little oxygen or too much carbon dioxide, then the cells will die. The upper respiratory system um, contains the nose and the pharynx, and the pharynx is also our throat, basically. So you can see here, there's the nose, and then this is the throat area here. Now let's think about what happens when we take a deep breath in. So our nose has three special functions. Firstly, the air that's coming into your nose is warmed by the blood in the nasal capillaries. It is moistened by mucus secreted from goblet cells within the nose and filtered by coarse hairs in the nostrils. If the air we breathe is smelly or fragrant, there's a small area of epithelium at the back of the nasal cavity called the conchi where special sensory receptors receive and respond to smells or odours and give us our sense of smell. And there are hollow chambers in the nose that modify our speech sounds when we take a breath, when we're talking. Now, with regards to the pharynx, and you can see on here that th there's a label here that says the nasopharynx, so they're talking about this area here at the back of the nose. Um, the air that we breathe travels through the nose or our mouth, down through the pharynx and down into the lungs. Our throat is composed of skeletal muscle and lined with mucous membranes. It's a shared passageway for both our food and for air. It also provides a hollow chamber for speech sounds and it contains our tonsils to stop foreign invaders as part of our immune system. Our throat has to deal with abrasive food particles, such as a toasted sandwich, and so it is lined with non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, which is designed for protection and lubrication during chewing and swallowing. Now, Anne, can you explain why a nurse may need to use an oral airway on a patient? So, Julie, this is what we call an oral airway, and this is used to obtain and maintain an open airway in the un unconscious patient device is inserted in the mouth and over the tongue and it sits in the oropharynx creating a path from the lips down to the pharynx. It works to prevent the tongue from slipping back and occluding the airway of the posterior pharynx. So we've just talked about um, the nose and the pharynx which is uh, the throat and now the next important structure that we need to talk about is the larynx. The larynx is really our voice box. Um, it's a hollow tubular structure connected to the top of the windpipe and um, it, air passes through the larynx on its way to the lungs but the larynx also produces speech sounds and prevents the passage of food and other foreign particles into the lower respiratory tract. So the larynx is made up of about nine pieces of cartilage that prevent the collapse of this structure and these plates are fastened together by membranes and muscle fibres. The front set of plates are called the thyroid cartilage, which you can see on here. This is the thyroid cartilage, and it has a central ridge and elevation, and this is what you'll know as the Adam's apple. Now, the main reason for mentioning um, this structure is that there's another structure that sits above this called the epiglottis. So we'll just put the epiglottis onto the uh, diagram for you. This is the epiglottis here. And it's situated as the, at the upper part of the larynx and it's a flat-like or leaf-like projection. The importance of the epiglottis is that as food is swallowed, the whole larynx structure rises up to the epiglottis, so the passageway of the respiratory tract is blocked. After the food passes into the esophagus, which is the food tube, the larynx relaxes and resumes its natural position. In this way, the glottis is closed off and guards the larynx so that food and liquid is diverted into the esophagus. If food or liquid particles get into the lungs, it causes an aspiration pneumonia. Aspiration is when you inhale food, stomach acid, saliva into the lungs. As we can see, 
this area here is a shared passage for both food and air. In your larynx and your pharynx, the food and air are both traveling down the same section. When you reach the point where the epiglottis is, what you're hoping to happen is that the food will actually be diverted away from the trachea and will not make its way into the lungs. You want this leaf-like structure to occlude that glottis area and send the food down the esophagus and down into the stomach. So this structure is really important because it prevents food or saliva or any other kind of fluid that's in the patient's mouth from going down into the lungs and causing bacteria and infection in the lungs. The next structure that we're going to look at is the trachea. So the trachea is this structure here. It's about 12 centimetres long and two and a half centimetres wide. It extends all the way down into the lungs and it splits here into two bronchi. The area where it splits is called the carina. It's composed of about 15 to 20 C-shaped um, pieces of hyaline cartilage. And it's this cartilage that gives the trachea not only its stability and its uh, structural integrity, but it also has the capacity to stretch and move as the lungs inflate and deflate. So Anne, can you tell us why we might need to use um, a tracheostomy tube? Yes, Julie. So earlier we showed you an oral airway where we maintain an airway between the mouth and the back of the throat if there was an unconscious patient. But in some cases, people have crush injuries or they may get swelling in their upper airway. And so in that case, we use a tracheostomy tube and that goes in here and enters it's directly into the trachea. Okay, the next main structure that we're going to look at is the bronchi. So just to summarize, this is the trachea and we've looked at the trachea and we've said that this is C-shaped cartilage that actually bifurcates and this area is called the carina. So if we look at the right main bronchi, you can see that it's about 2.5 centimetres in length and it's quite short and quite wide and it leads into these areas called bronchioles. You'll also notice that this uh, lung here is slightly shorter than the left lung because it has to accommodate the liver underneath it here. What's important about the right bronchus is that because it's shorter and slightly more vertically placed than the left main bronchus, if uh, food or food particles get down into the tr trachea and work their way down into the bronchi, they tend to travel down into the right lung rather than the left lung. And this would explain why most of the aspiration pneumonia you see will be located in the right main bronchus. Um, so if we look again over to this side, you can see that this bronchi is slightly longer. It's about five centimetres and it leads into these areas of uh, bronchioles in the same way as the right side. And um, these bronchioles, they become less and less cartilaginous and they become more and more smooth muscle. The next structure of note is the diaphragm. So as you can see, the diaphragm is quite a sizable structure and it's the principal muscle used in inspiration and expiration. And what we'll also see is we'll have a look at its location in respect to um, the lungs. So as you can see, these are the lungs again. And the important point of note here is that the diaphragm will be sitting around here. And the diaphragm is separating the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. But also what's important is that if you look at the size of the lung, the lung extends from the base of um, the diaphragm here and extends all the way out and past this clavicle here, which is your collarbone. This is important to know when you're actually auscultating the chest because you will put your stethoscope just above the clavicle. Now we're um, looking at the outside of the body and we're actually going to draw on um, the location of the lungs from the outside of the body. And as you can see, um, we're just drawing the left lung at the moment and you can see that there's a notch that extends inwards. That notch is there so that it can accommodate the structure of the heart. So that's pretty much how the lungs are if you were looking at the lungs from the outside of the body. And now I'm going to ask Anne to show us what you will do when you are auscultating or listening to breath sounds in the lungs. So you'll start by locating your stethoscope above um, the top of the of the uh, collarbone, which is the clavicle, because we saw on the uh, cadaver 
that the lungs actually extend from the diaphragm and beyond the, the, the clavicle. So Anne is just showing where you would locate your stethoscope and you would listen to breath sounds starting at the top of the lungs um, at the clavicle and moving all the way down across the lungs to the diaphragm. At the beginning of this presentation, we did explain that we were looking at the respiratory system so that we could talk about how cells in the body get oxygen and nutrients. And we discussed that it's the function of the lungs that um, assist in the exchange of oxygen and the removal of waste products such as carbon dioxide. Um, just to finish this presentation, what we need to talk about is the structures in the lungs that actually cause the gas exchange between the lungs and the blood. And these structures are called the alveoli. These are small little cauliflower-like projections that come off the bronchi. And that's essentially where the gas exchange takes place. This is where oxygen is passed into the blood and goes through the circulatory system and where carbon dioxide is then exchanged and removed through breathing. So that's really the end of our presentation and um, thank you very much for listening.